Hello, I am Peter Okwacha. Welcome to Focus on Africa, our top stories. Despite the rising number of COVID-19 cases in South Africa, we are told they haven't yet hit peak. But is the country ready to tackle the tide? Also on the program, COVID-19 and the link to injustice. From the pandemic to the protest that followed the death of George Floyd, we hear from Grassa Michelle, from a First Lady of South Africa and Mozambique. We believe it has to be an opportunity to address those structural issues which we have been aware of. And in sports, they've had to wait 30 years, but Liverpool are Premier League champions. Thanks for joining us here on Focus on Africa. At least 20 million people in the United States may already have been infected with COVID-19. That's according to the latest estimate by health officials. It has already officially recorded 2.4 million confirmed infections and more than 122,000 deaths. And with states easing their lockdowns at different times and in different ways, more people are at risk of catching the virus. In Africa, the numbers on the continent are also rising with almost 348,000 cases and more than 9,000 deaths. South Africa continues to be the worst hit country with cases now at more than 118,000. The peak has yet to come to South Africa and people are getting restless. They're out looking for jobs so they can buy food and people still haven't received their promised $20 a month stipend from the government. Well, joining me now from Johannesburg is our correspondent, Nomsa Maseko. Nomsa, what's the situation in South Africa today regarding COVID-19? As you said, that South Africa currently has over 118,000 infections. But I suppose what is in encouraging is the fact that more than 50% of those that have been infected are actually recovering. But the country still has recorded more than 2,200 deaths. In fact, the health minister last night said that what was of concern was the fact that there was a spike in the number of new infections every day. In fact, in just the last 24 hours, more than 5,000 new infections were recorded. And Lomsa, we keep being told that the country has not yet hit peak. Do we have any indication when this will be? Well, the government is, uh, is, is depending on, on, uh, on several models uh, that are going to suggest when this peak is expected. Because we are hearing that somewhere between July and September, that's when the country is going to see its peak. But this peak is going to differ from province to province. For example, in the economic hub of the country in Gauteng, the peak is only expected in August. But in the Western Cape, which is the epicenter of infections in this country, the peak is expected next month. And what about the country's state of preparedness for this tide that is being expected? How prepared are they? Well, every day we see the health minister and his team saying that the country is doing all it can to make sure that there are enough beds. Uh, in fact, stadiums are now being converted um, and, and uh, conference centers are also being converted into COVID-19 hospitals in preparation for a peak in these infections. But experts have also warned that the country may not have enough ventilators to deal with the peak that it is expecting. Nomsa, if, if we go to East Africa, we see that borders there are being closed and there are checks at uh, border points. What's the situation in Southern Africa? Is South Africa closing its borders to its neighbors? Well, South Africa closed its uh, borders in, since March already, at the end of March, when the first 21 days of the lockdown uh, was announced. That was a hard lockdown, level five where movement of people was very much restricted. But today there was a, a press conference by the tourism minister who was saying that uh, business is going back 
to normal uh, because the easing of the lockdown is now um, in place. She made no mention of the borders, but she spoke about tourism. She also spoke about the fact that restaurants were now going to open for, for people to sit down and actually enjoy their meals, but that alcohol is still not going to be allowed to be sold. In fact, there is a group uh, of an organization, basically, mm -hmm. that lost its appeal um, to for the government to okay. lift the uh, ban in cigarette sales. Okay, Nom Samaseko there, live from Johannesburg. Thank you very much. Well, the pandemic, as well as the death of George Floyd, have both revealed undeniable inequalities across the world. Grassa Michelle has seen some of the worst sides of injustice, having lived through the era of apartheid, as did her late husband, Nelson Mandela. A trail-blazing humanitarian in her own right, Grassa Michelle has signed an open letter calling the pandemic an opportunity to dismantle barriers to inequality. She told the BBC's Michelle Hussein why. We have been aware that we are societies which are very unequal. We have been aware of how this in, these inequalities are affecting mostly women, youth and children. But we, we, we got like used to it as our normal situation. The pandemic has brought to the surface in a very dramatic and glaring way these inequalities. We are in a situation where we cannot ignore them, we cannot even close our eyes to it. So that's why we believe, not only myself, but we, the women who have signed this open letter, we believe it has to be an opportunity to address those structural issues which we have been aware of, but we didn't have the boldness and the, 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 the focus of addressing them in short, medium, and long term. And that this is the opportunity which COVID is offering us. In the midst of these extraordinary and extreme um, few weeks, this unprecedented period, we've also had the death of George Floyd in the United States. And the anti-racism protests that have happened in so many different parts of the world. Do you fear that the emphasis on symbols is a distraction or do you think it is part of, of having an anti-racist stance? I think uh, it comes as people who are angry. And I think we should move on so that we, are, we become much more serene and much more rational. It is not the issue of uh, bringing down a statue which is going to resolve, I mean, the ills of the past. What is important is to look at the history of what is it which brought us to the situation where we are. And of course, you have to see who are the architects of this past. But it, I believe even it might be much more positive to keep them because you are going to tell generations to come, this is how it is started and this is how it should never continue to be the way it is. So I'm not really concerned with the, with the breaking, bringing down and breaking the status. Come now, a child who is five years now, if you don't have the Cecil Rhodes there, how are you going to explain that Apartheid had been once institutionalized in, in South Africa, or even the role of the, those many others who have taken us to a so divided society and to, in fact, to the resentment and the anger in which we are. And do you think that that is what Nelson Mandela would say if he was alive today? Because in his lifetime, the Rhodes Trust came together with him to create the Mandela Rhodes Foundation and that funds students to come to, to Oxford University. The argument that's been put forward by those who want the statue to stay, stay is, if it was all right with Mandela, it's all right with us. <laughs> you know, Mandela was uh, a, a person, a, a kind of his own. He, he, he was able to, to feel and to take us far ahead of how many of us think about these crucial issues. I know there was uh, uh, 
a misunderstanding of the step of establishing the Mandela Roads uh, uh, Foundation and the way it it has been. I mean, uh, dealing with the, with the with the issues of the past, but it was precisely to build the bridge, to build the bridge between the past and the present, and even to invest in areas like of the education, which is always about the future. And the symbolism of the Mandela Roads uh, Foundation was exactly to say, if apartheid had not been established, perhaps Mandela wouldn't have been who he has become in the history, not only of South Africa and Africa, of the world. Also subjected to such persecution. Grassa Michelle, they're speaking to the BBC's Michelle Hussein. Now, thousands of people have gathered in the Burundian capital, Gitega, for the funeral of the former president, Pierre Nkurunziza, who died suddenly earlier this month. Burundi's government has said he died from a heart attack, but there is speculation he had coronavirus as his wife had been ill with the disease. Mr Nkurunziza died shortly after an election won by Everest Ndaishimiye, who was sworn in last week. The former president was accused of serious human rights abuses. In Malawi, final results are yet to be announced in the rerun of last year's presidential election. But provisional results show a clear lead for the opposition candidate Lazarus Chokwera over the incumbent, President Peter Mutarika. Judges had rejected the first ballot won by the incumbent after evidence emerged of widespread rigging. Well, for more on this, now we're joined by Teresa Ndanga. She's chairperson of the Malawi branch of the Media Institute of Southern Africa. Now, the opposition is celebrating, Teresa. Are they jumping the gun? Not really. Um, as you have indicated, the unofficial result, which is uh, a result that is confirmed at district level, um, shows Opposition candidate Dr. Raza Chakwera has a clear lead. And when I say clearly, there's a huge gap between himself and the incumbent president Peter Mutarika, close to a, a million votes. And that gives them the confidence that um, this won't change, and uh, whatever the case, he will carry the day. So I would say it's not it's not early to celebrate, and we should also remember that uh, the opposition, the Malaya Congress Party, has been in opposition for a very long time, over 20 years. This really called for celebration for them. Mm. And what's been the reaction so far from the ruling party of President Mutarika? We have not heard from President Mutarika yet, but uh, we have heard uh, from his running mate, uh, who is Mr. Tupele Muruzi, um, uh, who is also leader of the United Democratic Front. He said this afternoon that at the moment, we should not consider that there is any winner or any loser yet. Uh, we needed to wait for the Malawi Electoral Commission to announce the winner, and then people can begin to celebrate. He also indicated that the president had sent him to the Malawians that he will accept whatever result, that is, that is President Mutarika, who accept whatever result that would be announced by the Malawi Electoral Commission. So um, basically, maybe it gives us an initiative. Mm. And uh, Teresa, can you just tell us, remind us what the significance would be, uh, what the significance of a victory for the opposition party would be? Um, this would be quite big because, as you know, in most African countries, it's not easy to unseat a government or a party. But it is also quite significant in Malawi because it's a reflection. Now the people have the power and therefore they expect those in public offices, those holding office, to carry their duties on trust. They need to sustain it. And if they don't sustain it, the people will use the same power to remove them. A clear message has been sent to those holding public office. Teresa Ndanga, thank you very much for talking to us here on Focus on Africa. She's the chairperson of the Malawi branch of the Media Institute for Southern Africa. Thank you. This is Focus on Africa from BBC World News with me, Peter Okwacha. Still to come on the program, lives under lockdown. We'll be hearing from you about your experiences during the pandemic.
I'm Peter Kwacha. Welcome back to Focus on Africa. At least 17 African countries will be celebrating their 60th year of independence this year. Senegal and Togo celebrated theirs in April, while Gabon's and Nigeria's come later on in the year. But today it is the turn of Madagascar. The island nation colonized by France was amongst the first on the continent to revolt against colonialism. The BBC's Raisa Isu looks back. Madagascar will overcome fear, disease and above poverty. That's what the Malagasy president, Andre Zouel, said during his address this morning. Today is an historic day for Madagascar, which is celebrating the 60th anniversary of the end of colonial rule. The island became more autonomous in 1958 when it joined the French community created by General Charles de Gaulle, who was in power in France at that time. It was two years later, in 1960, that Madagascar gained independence a freedom obtained in a soft way, according to the first Malagasy president, Philibert Tsiranana. The Malagasy leader maintained a strong relationship with the former colonial ruler, and that closeness would be his downfall. Madagascar's bond with France triggered a revolt in 1972. Nationwide protest and strike forced the leader, Philibert Tsiranana, to give up power and French military forces left the country. For the Malagasy population, it was a second independence, a real one. Raisa Isu there. You're watching BBC Focus on Africa. It's now time for some sports. I'm joined by Mimi. Mimi, it's been... Um, 30 years, but Liverpool fans are over the moon. Yes, indeed, Peter. That's all anybody is talking about. As you've mentioned there, after a long wait, Liverpool clinched their first league title in 30 years. And the fans were out celebrating on Thursday outside Anfield. But of course, four major African stars helped Liverpool to clinch that title. They are, of course, Sadio Mane, Mohamed Salah, Nabi Keita, and Joel Mati. There's another African star in Liverpool. He's a Belgian international, Divock Origi. But, but, of, Origi, but of course, he's of Kenyan heritage. His father, Mike Okoth Origi, used to play for the Kenyan national team. Peter Musembi of BBC Sport Africa spoke to him. And uh, as, a, as, a, as a young boy growing up in, in, in Nairobi and uh, in Kenya, it was always our dream, you know, to... to yes, please let me know when I have there. one. Whilst I'm speaking Unfortunately, to I was not able to reach there, but now my son is representing me, so you can imagine if it, um, it's like me being there, me winning, winning the, the, the play. So when uh, the final whistle was blown, it was, it was just, uh, yeah, all the emotions go through because I know what my son has gone through all these years. Since he was a kid, the working hard, all the pains, so, you know, there's all the sacrifices that uh, he has made, and us also as a family, then to see him succeed in this way, it, it gives you, uh, how do you say, it gives you a, a good feeling and, uh, and a proud moment as a parent to know that. A proud father there. Now let's get away from Liverpool and let's talk about racism in football. There was an incident earlier this week when a, when a White Lives Matter banner flew over the Manchester City and Burnley match. There's been a lot of talk about what more can be done to tackle racism in football. We've seen the Premier League, of course, issue out a statement and as well have the Black Lives Matter logo on their kiss. Now I'm happy to say joining me now is former England and Chelsea midfielder. She's, of course, of Ghanaian heritage, and she's currently the ambassador of Show Racism, the red card. Anita Asante, thank you so much for joining us here on Focus on Africa. I want to start a bit about, there's always so much talk about racism on continental Europe, but I want to know for you here in England, during your playing days, what racism did you face? Yeah, I think the challenges in the women's game is very different to the men's game because there are definitely far fewer black females playing in football and ethnic minorities in general. So maybe we're not as accustomed to facing the kind of racism and discrimination 
not to say that it doesn't happen, it has happened, um, and, and it shows that we still have a lot more work to do in general. Absolutely. Talking about a lot more work to do, there's been a lot of talk about in the Premier League, as I mentioned, they issued a statement and they've got the logos Black Lives Matter. Former and current players say more should be done in terms of black managers and top to bottom change. What would you like to see? Obviously, I think there are certain rules in place, like the Rooney rule that tries to encourage um, more uh, black coaches and people getting into interviews and, and in those positions but we need to see better you know hiring of, of black coaches and across all different levels of the game and you know I think it's something that won't happen overnight it will take time but as long as this discussion is one of the priorities in the in the boardroom and all levels then hopefully that tangible change will happen. And we've seen a lot of players kneeling what has that meant for you, seeing the players being very active on the pitch, something that we didn't see so much players here in England do before? Yeah, I mean, it's a great show of visibility of, you know, visibility and of solidarity to the, the whole movement. And, you know, I think it's great for young people to be able to see clear and visible role models that's showing that we won't tolerate this kind of racism or discrimination within our society and you know hopefully mm -hmm. encourage more black boys and girls to get involved in football absolutely now quickly anita you are a liverpool fan so celebrations for you you must be thrilled <laughs> yeah absolutely i think it's been a long time coming for all of us liverpool fans but ecstatic it's even greater to have of course four Africans you know representing the club and and playing exceptionally well they've been phenomenal so I'm I'm ecstatic absolutely thank you so much Anita for your time Peter it's back to you thank you now we continue to enjoy the videos you sent to us uh, about how life has been under lockdowns and how you've been coping here's a quick look at some of what you shared with us this week. We have been doing homeschooling. My mom has been teaching us. My dad has been gardening. Please don't touch your eyes, nose, or mouth. Wash your hands every day and stay safe. Well, this is what I practically spend my whole day doing. Because we have to stay indoors and stay safe from the coronavirus. We have to find something to do indoors in order to not get bored. I know we are being stopped from doing all our favorite outdoor activities, but yes, we have to stop doing them for now in order to stop the spread of coronavirus. Well, all these days of lockdown, I've been teaching online, of course. It hasn't been very easy. Imagine a geography teacher teaching online Imagine asking a student to draw a cross-section online. It hasn't been very easy, of course. It's quite a little bit good, but we are missing lessons at school, but it, that's the reason why it's bad. We want to be learning and finding out more stuff at school. It's not that, because even many people say that education is the key to success. Okay. So that's why I'm, I miss school a lot. During this lockdown, we've been keeping ourselves busy with this 1,000 piece puzzle. We're almost done with it and also school. Brilliant stuff. Now, some countries have started easing the lockdown restrictions. And if your country is one of them, we want to hear from you. What is the one thing you did or look forward to doing once measures eventually begin to be lifted? Send your video clip to us via WhatsApp. The number is plus four four seven five two one double six five one zero six. That's it on Focus in Africa for today. Thanks for watching. Goodbye.